Hi, my name is Barry Sterling Mitchell. I produce the Sterling Net Point Power Rankings and the Bias Plus Reports, and this is Ben and Barry on football. Hello out there, this is Ben Dickerson. I'm your co-host. Coming up on week 17 after a very raucous week 16, we're about to close the book on the NFL season. We have closed the book on many, many fantasy football seasons. Um, I won a lot of championships, so I won't bore you with that. But my daughter and I are in two together. One I'm the commissioner of, one she's the commissioner of. She won mine, and I won hers. Ah, uh, yeah, so proud of the two of you if you're winning uh, fantasy football ways. Now, she might be one championship out of maybe one or two leagues. You might be one championship out of 100 leagues because you play in so many different leagues. So how are you really doing across the board? Okay, so I didn't count them, but my closest estimate would be that I was probably in 40 different leagues. Oh, really? Yeah, but I probably only won about 15 to 18 of them. It wasn't my best year, I, and I was probably runner-up in a bunch, and uh, I made the playoffs in every single one of them. So, you know, what are you going to do? When it gets a little tough. Next year, next year I'm not going to get in as many. No? <laughs> nah, it gets distracting after a while, as much as I love it. Are you going to go get therapy? Because, you know, this is somewhat of an addiction with you. Well, the, the addiction is not playing fantasy football. My addiction is I'm a draftaholic, okay? So when the season's getting ready to start and the leagues open up, all you have to do is push a button and you're in a draft with a bunch of people you don't know. And I just keep doing it over and over and over. And before I know it, I got 40 teams. So I have to refrain from that and try to keep my concentration to my big leagues with my friends and my money leagues. I heard that. I heard that. Are they calling you over there? Are they calling? Because I don't say anything over here. It looks like they're calling me. <laughs> nah, that's my house phone. So look, Benny, let's uh, look back real quick. Um, people are listening. They want to know who we are, um, what we do, and what makes us even think we should be on here talking about football. But we have a few I'll call them protocols or standards that we utilize for our basis for discussion, one of which is the bias plus reports, which means we look at the matchups, utilize our net point rankings across the board for net points and for turnover differential, put that all together and kind of get an idea about who's favored for what games. Last week, ending week 16, the bias, which is purely a numerical, no opinion, no conjecture, finished out at 0.688, that's 68.8%, the favorite actually won the game. So just for let everyone out there to know, that's what it is when you have a base number, and that's what we're working with with that. Now, add to that your specialized knowledge and, what, and your hunches and all the good things that come along uh, with you know, watching these matchups, and then you get the Dickerson report. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just so happens that week 16 turned out to be the same. Uh, I turned out having the same winning percentage as the bias. We didn't pick all the same games, but we did both go uh, 11 and 5. So I thought that was interesting. Still, Great winning percentage. I think we're doing extremely well. And I do use the bias um, as, as a point of reference when I come up with my picks also. But I, I do add a little bit of my opinion and my conjecture. Absolutely. You know, we always, I always say, look at it as a baseline for, of information. It's like you're going to talk to your friends about what you think is going to happen in, in the game this coming weekend and you don't know the net points, <laughs> you don't know the points for, you don't know what scoring defense, you know, what their numbers look like, 
or what their turnover margins are. If you don't know those basic things and you're making predictions, I have no clue what you're basing it on. <laughs> Purely opinion, conjecture, eye test, memory. Ah, that doesn't get it done. That's why Vegas is rich. There's a gentleman on, um, on my Facebook page, and we always joke about, uh, especially Eagle fans, as being more fans of the team than they are of the game. And, you know, he, he posted after Hertz was struggling that Wentz can't play cornerback, you know? And I, that's what I did. That face you made, I put a question mark there, right? What? And basically his point was they're trying to blame it all on Wentz. Oh, oh, oh yeah. okay, okay. Or in other words, Hertz's struggles are attached to the weaknesses in the defense. Well, I don't know if he even took it that far. I think he's a Wentz fan. And I think he's just like, this ain't all Wentz fault. You know, if it wasn't this or that, Wentz would be doing great. And I'm, I know. And I'm like, are you not watching him? I mean, you've got rookie quarterbacks like Herbert who are also in not the best of situations. But when they drop back and they have to make a decision, they're not throwing the ball as they're getting ramrodded by four people, tossing it, in, you know, leading the league in turnovers <laughs> as, as Wentz was. I mean, literally leading, leading the league in turnovers. And you, he's not a rookie. He's a you know, second, third year quarterback at this point who you just expected a little more savviness, a little more, you know, of that decision, that good decision making, even as things are struggling. Let's face it. Russell Wilson was not in the best of situations early in the season. His defense was almost the worst in the league at one point. I believe they were down in the lower 20s at one point. I even used that as a basis for um, suggesting MVP for Russell Wilson because of how bad his defense was, yet they were still winning games and still in the positive in terms of net points. So Right. And, what, and Russell Wilson – as a quarterback, as a person, okay, was throwing the ball well, not turning it over, making good decisions, regardless of the situation in the game. That's the difference between a Russell Wilson. It's actually the difference between a whole bunch of quarterbacks and a Carson Wentz. Wentz was not doing those things. He was not throwing the ball well. His accuracy was off. His decision-making skills were horrible. And thus, you lead the league in interceptions, which has nothing at all to do with your defense, zero to do with your defense. Even if I wanted to take a stretch and say they had to change their game plans during games because the defense was so bad and they were always playing from behind, that he had to throw the ball more often than they would have wanted him to. But that's a stretch. Bad passes are bad passes. Okay, so, I mean, I, I don't know where he got that from, but no. But the point that I was trying to make, and I really don't want to beat up on him too bad. I mean, he's a fan, and, you know, it's nothing wrong with being a fan. It's just that sometimes when you're talking football, it, things aren't adding up when you're talking to someone who's just a fan because they're really not looking at it from the football fundamental positions in many cases, even though I think they think they are. Okay, so – 68.8 for both the Dickerson Report and the Bias Plus Report last week. Let's get ready to take a look at the um, Sterling Net Point Power Rankings and see what we have here. All right. And let's remind everybody once again: we can't say it more. Uh, we can't say it enough. Pay attention to the points against the points for the turnover differential and the overall power rankings, because these are the numbers that we use to come up with the bias. So we're going to start out by taking a look at the defensive side of the ball. And we'll focus on points against PA. And as you can see, I, tried to color code it 
the teams that are in red are teams that are still in the hunt for a playoff position. You'll see teams with asterisks, asterisks, however you say that word, and letters. Asterisks. Thank you. <laughs> and letters indicating that they've already clinched a division title or a spot in the playoffs, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and let's take a quick look defensively. The number one team has not locked in a spot yet. Mr. Benjamin, that would be the Miami Dolphins, only giving up a league low 282 points. We like Flores, don't we? Yeah, this is, this is uh, well, I'm not surprised. The Dolphins' defense is very good. Um, they play a, a real high risk, man-to-man uh, -man type of defense. Uh, their secondary is young, fast, and it doesn't matter who they're playing. It doesn't matter what the offense is. They stick to their plan. They play man. They send pressure. And uh, it's worked for them very well this year. If you know what you're going to do and you got the people to do it, do it, you know? Steelers coming in second with 288. That Steeler defense is still potent. Rams, 289. Ravens, even 300. And Washington, <laughs> Washington, that NFC East coming in at fifth place defensively, giving up 315 points. What do you think about your top five? Well, I think top five looks good. Uh, it's it's a good thing and makes week 17 even more intriguing since that uh, one, two, three, four of the top five are still in the hunt and haven't clinched yet. So obviously it's their points against ranking, their defense that's keeping them in the hunt and could possibly catapult one, two, three, or how, who knows how many of them into the big dance. It is an amazing situation. Number six is the Chiefs. So the Chiefs defense has been pretty good. It hasn't been super great, but they're getting the job done. You know, they give up some points at coming in at 6 324, one ahead of uh, one spot ahead of the Buccaneers at 328, who are just ahead of the Saints at 330. The Bears coming in at 335, and your New York football giants rocking that 10th spot at 338. The Bears yes. and the Giants still in the hunt. Very proud of my Giants defense. It's been solid all year. Uh, I like the way they're playing. I like the way that they're being coached. It has definitely helped them along the way as the offense has been, you know, has been having their struggles at times with injuries and poor offensive line play, but somehow the defense has kind of kept them in the hunt and they do absolutely have a chance to make the playoffs. I think that's great. Bears have been pretty steady all year. Saints are getting better. The Chiefs and the Buccaneers are two teams that have really good offenses that once they get control of a game, it helps their defense because then, you know, the D-line can pin their ears back and really, really rush. And it gives the secondary a chance to be a little bit more flexible in their coverage downfield. So that's how I think uh, those guys add up. The um, the Bills are. Uh, I want to skip down on to a few, but I want to mention the Bills because they they're getting so much uh, praise. And they're all the way down in 14th place. Let me just run through. Uh, 11 is the Patriots, 12th the Seahawks, and 13th the Colts. Seahawks and Bills are extremely interesting because both defenses were on the other side of the column in the lower half or earlier in the season. In the last three games, however, the Seahawks are actually number one and average points allowed, only allowing an average of nine, and the Bills are number two, only allowing an average of 14. So those are two teams whose defenses need left something to be desired, but apparently they're getting their act together. Oh, they're getting their act together big time. 
big time. Uh, both teams had basically the same problems, lack of pass rush and problems stopping the run. They seem to have those problems corrected. This is, this is a big deal for those two teams, and it's going to make them a problem in the playoffs. Uh, the Colts' defense um, has had some breakdowns. They're actually tied at 348, 348 points allowed uh, with the Seahawks. Um, and then at 15, the Cardinals. Uh, again, Colts and Cardinals still yes. in the hunt. Um, nothing locked down yet. But both and teams are having breakdowns. Like you said, the Colts are having breakdowns. The Cardinals defense is having a lot of breakdowns lately. You're absolutely right. It's an amazing thing. So on the other side of the ledger, from 17 to 32, again, we let everyone know these charts are available at the Sterling Net Point Power Rankings on Facebook, on our Facebook page at STNPPR. Um, so we're just going to talk quickly about the Browns, the Titans, and the Cowboys, who are the only three teams on the right side, where just about every other team uh, is pretty much eliminated. They all got E's beside their name. The Browns are coming in at 21st, the Titans at 23, and the Cowboys at 30th. Ah. <laughs> it doesn't look good. Uh, the Browns and the Titans, ah, I, I was going to say, over the last few weeks, I think that um, these teams have suffered the same fate as say the Colts and the Cardinals defensively where they've been in games and then all of a sudden have had some defensive breakdowns that kind of betrayed them. Um, but I thought the Browns were fairly solid overall through the season. Um, even the games that they lost, they were usually low scoring and close games. I think except for one, I think the Ravens blew them out, but that was about it. The Titans are a team uh, very similar to the Buccaneers and the Saints, where if their offense is cooking and they get a lead on you, it's really tough to come back on them because they give you Derrick Henry left, Derrick Henry right, Derrick Henry up the middle, and then their defense can kind of relax and play free and really send a strong pass rush. So that would be the difference between those two teams. The Cowboys defense is quite an enigma, if you ask me. I don't know. I think they put something in the water over there because they went from completely inept to actually flying around, making tackles, and being able to cover people all of a sudden. It's incredible. I don't know what to make of the Cowboys' defense. Well, the, in terms of the Titans, we saw Green Bay have their way in the snow with the Titans and, and, and push that number uh, up in terms of the amounts of points that they were giving up. Interesting thing is, as I look at Cleveland, in the last three weeks, they're averaging giving up 25.3 points per game, okay? Tennessee is averaging allowing 25 points per game. And the Dallas Cowboys are only allowing 19 points per game. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, man. Big difference. <laughs> Big difference, and it's going to make – for some fun times um, as we get to uh, week 17. And we're going to talk about week 17 because that's coming up very shortly. Um, <laughs> it's going to make for some fun times. All right, so that's enough about defense, Mr. Dickerson. Let's talk offense. Let's talk the fun part here of the NFL. It's what the NFL wants us to talk about. You know that. That's what that's what sells tickets, right? Scoring Offense points. Tickets. Offense sells tickets, defense wins championships. That's how we look at it. Look who's number one. <laughs> With the big Z next to him. <laughs> Which means the Packers still have a little something to play for, right? Um, yeah, I think they would be playing for uh, home field throughout. Okay. All right. Number one in scoring 
um, putting up 474 points. Number two is the Chiefs, 452. Number three, the Titans, 450. And as you can see, again, the Titans are still in the hunt. Number four, the Saints, 449. And the much aligned offense of the Buccaneers are actually fifth at 448. So let's just stop with the top five right now. Offensively, only the Titans are still in the hunt in terms of top five scoring. That uh, might be why some of these other guys are still, quote, in the hunt. Well, yes. Now, I'll talk about the Titans first. Obviously, everybody knows about Derrick Henry. That's that's no secret. Um, but Ryan Tannehill had a really good season last season. It was a big question mark as to whether that was a fluke or he could bring that same magic back this season. For the most part, he has, and I think that's why they're doing so well offensively. The thing is, if by chance a team is able to slow down Derrick Henry, and when I say slow down, I mean keep him under 100 yards, then Tannehill has to take over, and he has to be the difference. And for the most part, he has. Thus, they are still third in points four. But in the games where he has a little bit of trouble, they haven't won some of those games. So there are some question marks there, and I think the snow kind of did them in there last week. Um, and and, and it, I, I believe the snow actually troubled Tannehill a little bit more than it did Derrick Henry because I think he finished with like 90-something yards rushing. But Tannehill's stats were not good. Um, and real quick for the rest of the top five, look at these offenses. Number one, you got to love the Packers. And you got to love Aaron Rodgers for MVP. And I'm not saying I'm picking him, but you got to have him up there in the top two, three. Number one, because when you look at them offensively, they only have a few sure thing weapons. Basically, it's Aaron Jones at running back, Devontae Adams, who is having one of the greatest seasons a wide receiver's ever had. And then everybody else is pretty much a secondary weapon. So it's amazing that they're at number one. The Chiefs have probably, arguably, the best quarterback in the league in Patrick Mahomes, and he has several weapons, although Clyde's, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire has been injured lately. I think he's coming back this week, or he'll at least be ready for the playoffs. And then you got Tyreek Hill, and you got Kelsey. Dynamic weapons, but still only two. Titans, same thing. Tannehill playing well. Good receiving core, Corey Davis, A.J. Brown, and then, of course, you know, Derrick Henry. The Saints, oh, my goodness, they unleashed Alvin Kamara last week. Mike Thomas has been hurt, but Drew Brees is still making do with his receivers. And then the Buccaneers. If you want to look at overall weapons on an offense, the Buccaneers are probably the number one team for overall weapons. Their receiving core is so good that at times I believe Tom Brady has a problem with who he's going to feature and who he wants to get the ball to. I mean, they're just loaded. More weapons than the Chiefs? Absolutely. They absolutely have more weapons than the Chiefs. Name, name a Chiefs wide receiver besides Tyreek Hill real quick. <laughs> You, you do that to me all the time, but I'm yeah, not. Yeah, I know. You should be ready. <laughs> you, should be, you should be ready for that. Sammy Watkins. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the guy, you know. And, and I would have to, I would immediately go to Kelsey because even though he's a tight end, as far as I'm concerned, he's a receiver. <laughs> right. But when you look at the Buccaneers, you got Godwin, Evans, Gronk, and AB. Bang, 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 boom. Oh yeah, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. They they've got they've got some weapons. All right. Speaking of weapons, at quarterback, you have um damn, what's the name? Josh for the for the Bills. Yes, um, also in the MVP conversation. Also in the MVP conversation, along with number seven in scoring with 443, Russell Wilson and the Seahawks. Always in the MVP conversation. And then eight through 10 are all teams that are still in the hunt. The Ravens at eight at 430, the Colts at nine at 423, and the Cardinals at 10th at 403. So that rounds out 
your top 10. Um, I'll quickly mention that as you skip down, the teams that are still in contention, coming in 14th, 15th, and 16th in consecutive, um, consecutively, you have the uh, Browns with 384, the Dolphins 378, and the Cowboys 376. Again, these, some of these teams are really starting to get this up together. The Cowboys have averaged 36 points per game over the last three games. Um, and Buffalo has averaged 37 points per game. Baltimore, where are the Ravens at? They were number, they're number eight. They actually, in terms of the last three weeks, are first in scoring, averaging 38 points per game. So some of these teams are getting hot offensively. Um, their season numbers are, are maybe a little more conservative looking. And you look at it and go, okay, who's doing what, who's doing what? But right now, there's some serious momentum. Uh, Tampa Bay's uh, 34.7, New Orleans 34 uh, points per game, Green Bay 31, and Indianapolis 31.7, and Tennessee 30. So that rounds out all of the teams that are scoring in the 30s. Last three, now this is the opposite. The, the uh, Chiefs are actually averaging uh, 30 points a game over the season, but over the last three, they're averaging 27.3 points per game. So they've calmed down a little bit in terms of their scoring, um, but they're second you know, overall for the, for the year in, in gross numbers there. So. On the right side, the Bears, 18 in scoring. The Rams, 19th in scoring with 356 and 354. Washington, there's your NFC East again at 26, 315. And the Miracle Giants at 31st in scoring, still alive, 257. Somehow, some way. Somehow. <laughs> some way <laughs> it's still happening that is absolutely amazing all right let's run this thing over uh let's see here here we go our favorite person and you've warned me not to call this person a person <laughs> because that person is not a person that person is not a person turnover differential tied tied as life to the situation. I mean, how much, how much, when do, when do you normally get a good scrum in a football game except doing a turnover? You know, maybe in those goal line situations and it's not so, where everybody's pushing, one team's trying to push their guy into the end zone, that's time, trying to push him away, but you get a good fumble. <laughs> yeah, good scrum on a fumble or uh, uh, a sack scooping score. Um, a dazzling interception with a great run back. Those are exciting plays, not only for the play itself, but for what it means to the team. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you get one of those good scores. You know, in rugby, I always watch them. They get those things where everybody's kind of got their head all down in a pile. So one guy takes the ball and shoots it out between his legs to somebody else and they start running around. I still don't know all the rules with rugby, but it's another form of football. So, you know, I look at it if it's on because <laughs> it's football. Well, you know, however, whatever situation it is. Let's look at one through three here in turnover differential. You're tied at 11 between the Titans and the Dolphins, plus 11. Again, turnover differential like net points, one of those stats where you have both positive and negative numbers. The Colts are third at 10, but they're tied with fourth place Steelers who also have 10. A lot of little double ties here. One and two at 11, three and four at 10, five and six at seven. That's the Chiefs and the Bucks. Seven and eight, the Packers and the Panthers at six, nine, 10, and 11, all tied at four. Falcons, Browns, and Saints, Seahawks, Ravens, Tied at three for 12th and 13th place, and tied at two, 14 through 16, Bills, Jets, and Chargers. Now, 
a lot more balance in terms of the number of teams on the left and the number of teams on the right who are still in the running when it comes to turnover differential. Uh, yes. You know, uh, you got Absolutely. your Giants at 18, Cardinals at 19, 20 if you have the Rams, 21st, you have the Bears. That would be the Giants at plus one, Cardinals minus one, Rams minus two, Bears minus three. And then the last two who are still in the running are 23rd and 24th. That's, again, that NFC East, Cowboys in Washington at minus four and minus five. So if your Giants can maintain this turnover differential, you guys got a shot, man. I believe any team that can control the turnovers always has a shot here. Well, there's one thing for sure. If you turn the ball over, it hampers you tremendously in winning ball games. So you want to be on the positive side of the turnover differential at all times, if at all possible. The fact that they're on the plus side but only by one kind of tells you why they are where they are, but I'd still rather be plus one than minus one. <laughs> Put it that way. Yeah. They need to keep it up. Yeah. They keep it up. <laughs> you know, they gotta be they gotta keep it up. And I'll tell you, these teams that have uh minus numbers and turnover differential, that's probably again what's hampering them and keeping them where they are or keeping them from being higher in the overall power rankings. Turnover differential is, is, is extremely important. And it makes a difference in games, which is why we add it in when we do the bias plus. Turnover differential is extremely important. And these teams up at the top with 11, 11, 10, 7, 6, you're going to find that those are the better teams. They're the teams that don't fumble, that don't throw interceptions. The quarterback takes care of the ball, okay? And their defense hits, stays on their toes, and makes plays. And we remind people that, again, turnover differential is when you subtract the takeaways from the giveaways. So if you're in a positive, that means you're taking it away more. And if you're in a negative, that means you're giving it away more than. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny, even in Madden, I know what my takeaway threshold is between winning and losing. In other words, any more than two if i'm negative two on the turnover differential i'm pretty much gonna lose that game wow but if wow. i'm negative one i can still win i can win with with just you know giving up one more turnover than what i when i took i can still you know make up that difference but uh some of these teams are not going to now the titans the dolphins and the colts should all be very competitive just based on their turnover differential so this would be very interesting. All right. Lastly, in terms of the net point power rankings is the bottom line here, net points. Again, net points, the difference between the points scored and the points allowed. And in first place, still in the running, having locked down nothing yet, you have your Baltimore Ravens with plus 130 net points. Right behind them are the Chiefs at 128. Right behind them are the Packers at 121, the Buccaneers at 120 and fourth, and rounding out the top five, the Saints at 119. And you got to really give it to the Saints because what? It's been, what, three or four weeks with Taysom Hill at quarterback? Yes, yes. And they're yes. still in top five in net points. Yes. Uh, let me say this about the Saints real quick. Uh, to make the decision that they made, and we discussed this, uh, the decision to start Taysom Hill in Drew Brees' absence instead of going with Jameis Winston, which is, I mean, for all intents and purposes, Jameis Winston was brought there to be the backup quarterback. But for some reason, they decided to go with Taysom Hill. I think I kind of can rationalize why they may have done that. If I try to think like Sean Payton thinks, obviously I'm nowhere near the thinker of Sean Payton, but I'm trying to figure out the logic behind it 
Um, and all I could come up with was, it was sort of kind of an experiment and it worked out well. And they said, okay, let's do it again. I mean, they picked the game that they wanted to do or it just turned out that the game they got a chance to do it was the game against Atlanta, a team that they figured they could beat anyway. And they knew Taysom Hill would give Atlanta a problem right off the bat, starting a game. Things worked out. I think he played a little better than they thought he would. And they just went with it. Poor Jameis gets lost in the shuffle. But hey, it's crazy. The bottom line is they were successful. And that's worked out for them. And their defense got going. And hence, here they are in the running and 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 looking good. So, you know, what are you going to say, man? Saints are our problem, just like they always are. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let's get back to it and we'll go through the last portion of this. Most of the teams that are still in the running are on the left side and in the positive uh, six. You have the Steelers at 106, plus 106 net points, right ahead of the Bills at plus 96, who are tied with the Dolphins at plus 96. Remember when we talked the bias report, you know, that'll come into play here because they play each other. <laughs> So that's a matchup right there. Seahawks at 85 net points at ninth and in 10th place, the Colts at plus 75. Your 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15th place teams are all still in the running with nothing locked down. That's the Colts, 75, Rams plus 65, Cardinals plus 54, Titans plus 49, Bears plus 21, and the Washington football team coming in, breaking even at net point zero. So that rounds out the top 15. I'll simply mention that on your right-hand side, these teams are all still in the running for playoff positions, but they are actually in the negative in terms of net points. At number 18, the Browns at minus 13. And number 24, the Cowboys at minus 74. And at number 28, the Giants at minus 81. So the one thing about net points, the sins of the past stay with you. You can work your way out of them to some degree, but it depends on how bad you were. Now, in the Browns case, the Browns are, are weird because, again, they have a, a winning win-loss record, but they're in the negative in terms of net points. And we know one of the reasons for that, that what we call the skew, was the beating that they took at the hands of the Ravens, like first game of the season. Yeah, that really hampered them. It, it, it's hard to come back when you when you take a, a big loss like that, especially at the beginning of the season. It's, it's like it's an uphill battle the entire time as far as the, the net points are concerned. Um, but you know, that's why we break it down to points for and points against. So you can kind of see how the team's going in this separate, uh, categories, but yes, that's definitely going to hurt them for, for in the power rankings, no doubt. Yeah. That, that AFC North is a mess, man. That's, you know, the Ravens, the Browns, um, both of them are still in it, you know, are still in the running there. Big disparities are, uh, big, big difference between the net points um, here. The Browns are minus 13 and Ravens are plus 130 and yet they're both 10 and 5. <laughs> so that just, that says something about those teams. We'll find out what, what it says as we get through the rest of this season here. But wrapping up the Sterling uh, Pro Football Net Point Power Rankings, Mr. Dickerson, any last words on this segment? Uh, I, I, I like the top uh, 10. Uh, it would probably be different if you watch television and the, the networks that, that report on football. Um, but of course, we go purely by the numbers. Uh, and like we said, a really bad loss or a really big win can kind of skew where you may show up. 
But let's face it, this is overall, week by week, that we come up with these numbers. Mm -hmm. So to me, these numbers are the true uh, outlook as far as uh, a, a team's power and power ranking and everybody belongs where they belong. Um, if you just ask me off the top of my head, I probably wouldn't say Ravens, Chiefs, Packers. I'd probably say Packers, Chiefs, Bills, Steelers, something like that. You know what I mean? But that would be based on recent history and opinion. We go truly, uh, purely by the numbers. That's why you got to love it. And, and usually the numbers work out. More often than not, let me say, more often truly, than not, truly, truly, the numbers work out. Speaking of the numbers working out, we're getting ready to work out the next portion of the show, which is the Bias Plus Reports. Stick with Ben and Barry on football. All right, let's get started with the Bias Plus Report. Again, the Bias Plus Report is how we look at matchups for the upcoming pro football uh, weekend, uh, where we look at the difference between net points that is called the bias, the team with the greater net points, the bias favors that team. And then we also look at turnover differential. Again, uh, where you have two teams playing, the team with the greater turnover differential numbers, the bias favors that team. And we combine all of that into what we call the bias plus reports. So now that we've given that particular explanation, let's see what it actually looks like for game number one of the weekend. Dolphins, Bills, bias plus score of nine. <laughs> Ooh, that's close. Nine favors the Dolphins. And when I looked at this, you know, at first, and I mentioned this in the previous segment where we looked at the Sterling Net Point Power Rankings, both the Dolphins and the Bills had equal net points. I believe it was 96 net points for the two of them. 96 net points for both teams. So the difference so, is the turnovers. The difference is the turnovers. Miami uh, in second place with plus 11, again, tied at first, Buffalo coming in at 14th place with plus two. So that nine turnover differential difference bias favors the Dolphins. Hmm. That's a big <laughs> deal. Uh, I, I'll say this. Let everybody remember it's week 17. Some teams have some things locked up. Some teams have everything locked up and some teams really need a win or some combination of uh, wins or losses to get help to get into the playoffs. So that means that some teams lineups might not necessarily be the same lineup they would play in the middle of the season or even last week for that matter. That being said, uh, let's take a look at this game. So first of all, Two really good games played by these two teams last week. The uh, Buffalo Bills blew out the Patriots 38 to nine. This game was no contest. Josh Allen was tremendous. 27 to 36, 320 yards, four touchdowns. Would have had a fifth touchdown. Uh, this is through the air. Would have had another, a fifth touchdown on the same drive he had two drop passes in the end zone by two different players. So the guy's on fire. Uh, Stefan Diggs is his number one guy. Stefan Diggs can do no wrong. Great route runner, great hands, nine balls, 145 yards, three touchdowns. So three of the five touchdowns through the year, three of the four touchdowns through the year went to Stefan Diggs. You can't sleep on Cole Beasley. Their running game isn't where they'd like it to be, but it's, it's efficient. And uh, Josh Allen's work on the ground helps them out a little bit too. In fact, he, he, he doesn't help them as much as Lamar Jackson helps the Ravens ground game, 
but he's a big plus for their ground game. Now on the other side, you had the Miami Dolphins. They went into Las Vegas. They won the game. But Tua Tungavailoa, the guy who was gifted the starting job for Miami, did not look good. He didn't look good at all. And in fact, shortly after they came out for the second half, I think he had one series maybe, um, they benched him and they brought in Ryan Fitzpatrick. And we were texting during the game and I said to you, I think they'll leave Tua in unless he has trouble getting them downfield or they just can't move the ball. If they happen to score, they will probably keep him in. Well, they scored, but after that, it was three and out, three and out, three and out. They pull him, and Ryan Fitzpatrick moves them right down the field, then has the miracle finish. Tremendous game, great, fun game to watch. Um, terrible blunders by the, Raven, uh, by the Raiders, but we don't want to get into that. The main thing is, two has been named the starter for this week. OK, we went back and forth about whether we thought they put Tua in as a starter too early in the season. It's starting to prove itself to me that he's really not ready. He may have been better off if they let Ryan Fitzpatrick stay in at least a few more games before they anointed him. OK, but he seems to be having a little trouble with the speed of the game, if you ask me now. That being said, there's a good chance that the Bills will not start all their key players. If they sit down Josh Allen and if they sit down Stephon Diggs, which I believe they will, then I have to go with the Dolphins. But I don't trust Tua. This is a tough one for me, but I'm going to go with the bias on this one, and I'm going to go with the Dolphins. Interesting um, that so much of this – came down to the turnover differential over the last three weeks. Indianapolis is fourth in turnover differential at plus one. Miami is third at 1.3. So that gap closed has closed somewhat. But like you said, and what we what we've been finding out as we've looked back over uh, the numbers, um, the bias plus report is really based on the history, your net point history over the over the year. It's a bit of a blunt in, instrument in terms of that. You get to week 17, and those people that produced all of those net points are sitting on the bench in some cases because they're being protected health-wise. And so the numbers look a little weirder. You really need to kind of be up on what teams are doing. That's that added information that you want. You know the strength of the team, um, but these little adjustments that they're making, it's almost like what happened with the Browns, and we'll talk about them in an upcoming game, but last week uh, they had so many of their starters that were not able to uh, to play. And is it one of the teams, I think it's, uh, it, again, is running into that this week where their starters are coming up positive. So you've got some other situations. All right. Next up, Ravens at Bengals. That's a bigger bias, man. That's a bigger bias right wow, there. Wow, that's a huge bias. And that is the largest bias. No, it's not. It's not the largest bias of the weekend. Uh, it's the second largest. That's okay. <laughs> that's pretty big. Favors the Ravens. Yeah. Okay. So just got finished mentioning Lamar Jackson and what he does for the Ravens run game. Not that they need as much help as uh, the Bills do, but help he does nonetheless. And in fact, he's probably um, leading the team in rushing. I haven't looked at the numbers, but I'm pretty sure he has. Um, real tidy last week, 17 to 26, 183 yards. They don't want him throwing the ball. 30 plus times anyway. If they're throwing the ball 30 plus times, it probably means they're in a scuffle or they've fallen behind. So if he can go 17 to 26, that's great for him. 183 yards. He threw two touchdown passes anyway, which is all the most important thing is he finds the end zone. On top of that, he ran the ball 12 times for 81 yards. So you add that to J.K. Dobbins, Gus Edwards, and the fact that Marcus uh, uh, Marquise Brown 
has found his hands and is able to catch again. And Mark Andrews, the really good tight end, is up the seam and over the middle at will. And that makes the Ravens look real strong as they uh, get ready for this, uh, this last push to make it into the playoffs. Um, they'll be far too much for the Bengals. I, I got to go with the Ravens. Even All right. The Bengals have played well. Bengals have played well these last couple of weeks. I, I got to give them credit, okay? But in this scenario, where the Ravens really need to win, not going to happen. Got to go with the Ravens. Well, you know, we do uh, what's called the bias plus buster of the week. I don't know. This week we might need to add in the bias plus spoiler. <laughs> Because with the That's Bengals, a thought. that's a thought. Because there, there's going to be one. Believe me. I'm telling you, the spoiler of the week. But you're going with the Ravens. Going with the bias. Next up, Steelers at Browns. <laughs> bias plus score of 125 favors the Steelers. As we said, the Browns have a have a uh, positive win loss number, but a negative net point number. Um, what you're looking at here is the uh, 12th ranked offense of Pittsburgh against the 21st ranked defense of Cleveland and the 14th ranked offense of Cleveland against the second ranked defense of Pittsburgh. Again, the bias plus favors the Steelers. Who do you have? Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. So Big Ben's probably not going to play. James Conner will probably not play. After that, I don't know. Um, the Steelers have a pretty good bunch of wide receivers that are all fast and all young and can all play. Now, the Browns, on the other hand, need this game. They need this win, okay? And Baker Mayfield has not looked good. Well, he didn't look good in his last game. In fact, they lost to the Jets. Very, very bad. However, he was missing four of his top receivers. Okay, fine. It's a COVID thing. And to tell you the truth, uh, considering that they put them on the COVID list 24 hours before the game, I believe, it's very possible that they won't be ready for this week either. I think they got to be out 10, 14 days. Uh, I don't know. It's questionable as to whether he'll have those receivers. He's got to have them to win this game. I mean, you got practice guys, you got fifth and sixth string guys, okay? Last week, they basically had no practice snaps. This week, they have, what, four days of practice snaps. They'll be a little bit better, but I don't think they'll be good enough to beat the Steelers. I, I got to go with the Steelers on this one. Uh, Wait, I'm not sure. <laughs> And you know what's hilarious because you've got a debilitated Browns team, and you said I'm not sure, but I pretty much they made the announcement that uh, Ralph Lisberger is not going to play. Yeah, I, and that, that's where I was going to go next. We're looking at Mason Rudolph here, okay? <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're looking at Mason Rudolph against a hungry, mad determined Cleveland Browns defense. Hmm. I sure do love defense, bro. <laughs> I'm going to go with the defense. I'm picking the Browns. Uh, well, I'm, picking the Browns. Yeah. I'm picking the Browns to win this game. I think Baker will do just enough. And I think that the Browns defense will, will do just enough to pull this one out. And there's going to come a point in this game if it's a real struggle where the Steelers are going to say, you know what, it ain't worth it. I'm not saying they're going to quit, but mm, yeah, I'm taking the Browns. Wow, man, you just really just I am confidently off taking the Browns. <laughs> the, more, the more I say it, the better I feel. I'm confidently <laughs> taking the Browns. A debilitated Browns against a Mason Rudolph-led Steelers. You like the Browns' defense, but the Steelers have the number two defense in the league. That's true. 
So I think there's going to be a def- – well, it looks like a defensive battle. looks like a good setup for that. All right. You made your call. You're going with the Browns, going against the biased. Next up, Vikings at Lions. Now, this is a team where both teams are pretty much eliminated. Bias plus score 97 favors the Vikings. I don't think they're going to hold Kirk Cousins out. Uh, but the Lions quarterback is is he still Stafford? Is he is he still hurt? Matt Stafford's pretty banged up. If if I was the Lions, I wouldn't play him because the game means nothing. Um, and it, there's rumors that um, they may put Stafford on the trading block to try to help better their team. Uh, he's been around for a while, but he's still been affected. But I, I, it makes no sense. Even if you win, you don't really win anything. And if he gets hurt any worse than he already is, then that lowers his value in a, in a, in a trade proposal. So I don't think they're going to play Matt Stafford. Uh, by the same token, the Vikings have been eliminated. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, Vikings are eliminated. However, pretty much all the main players on the Vikings are healthy. I think they go for the win. I think Cousins plays... I think, uh, oh, Dalvin Cook is not going to play. He has a family issue. It's personal, and he will not be back in time for the game. I just read that. Now, if I'm proven to be wrong, uh, things can change. I don't know. But from what I heard, he has a serious family issue. I don't know if he had a death in his family or whatever it was. But he has shot back home to, uh, I think he's from Florida, and um I don't, they don't expect him to be there to play uh, in this game. But, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to go with the Vikings. I would take the Vikings even if the Lions were at full strength. doesn't really matter. All right. Going with the bias in this particular case, going with the Vikings. Next up, J-E-T-S, Jets, 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 going up to visit the Patriots. The Patriots have a nice, fat, bias plus score last week the jets were the bias plus buster of the week it favors the patriots this week now we saw cam talking about his frustration and his sacrifices i thought it was funny him using the word sacrifice what he's sacrificed this year for the patriots i just thought that was comical I don't, I don't think he meant to use the word sacrifice. I mean, he may have, but I don't think the, the word sacrifice really fit his situation. Now, we'll say this in, in Cam's defense. Everybody in the Patriots organization has gone on record as to say that Cam is the most upbeat, confident, hardest working, first guy there, last guy to leave, putting everything he's got in the game plans and all that stuff. They have nothing but good things to say about him. So I kind of understand his frustration. I believe that he is trying exceptionally hard to be a leader on this team and to be productive. Just doesn't have it anymore. And I use this analogy a lot. I use it again. He looks like a shot fighter, man. He looks like, you know, if you if you let your guard down, he can still clip you, but he's only going to hurt you. He's not going to knock you out. He's just He just doesn't have it. I don't see it. So, you know, there's no need to get into a lot of details on this one. I'll say this. Sam Darnold looked good last week. They beat Cleveland, okay, which you can say is a big deal or not a big deal, all right? But they beat the Rams the week before. I say that's a big deal. Um, Sam Darnold was 16-32, 175 yards. He threw two touchdown passes, no turnovers, and the defense did a good job keeping down Chubb and Hunt. Because even when I heard that the Browns wouldn't have the receiving core, I'm like, eh, so they'll just run him into the ground. But guess what? Jets loaded up the box and stopped the run. Basically stopped their run, the Cleveland Browns. So, yeah, kudos to the Jets. I'm going to pick them to win this game. Ah, uh, yes. I, I love it when you just go rogue, man. You just, like, just want to go against the grain, the old – the old revolutionaries coming out here. Power to the people going with the Jets over the Patriots. Come on, Cam. 
Jamie Christmas. All right. This, I do believe, is the smallest bias plus of the weekend. Ergo, in the running for intriguing game of the week. It means everything. It is the weird ass NFC East. Bias plus score four favors the Cowboys. The Cowboys is getting it together just in time. They got Andy the Red Rifle Dolphin coming at you. And, you know, I saw Daniel Jones. Is he a little cross-eyed? You know, I don't – the Giants got the monopoly on the funny-looking quarterbacks. (laughs) First, first we had years and years of Eli with the, we don't know if he's smiling, frowning. He just has that face, you know what I mean? And, and now Daniel Jones looks a little cuckoo. I'll tell you what the problem is with Daniel Jones. He's not 100% back from that hamstring. And I think he's got a little ankle too. He's, he's still gimpy, man. But I, I give him credit for getting out there and trying. I mean, they have a chance to make the playoffs. This is a team that was picked to probably come last in the division, if not next to last. And here they are with an opportunity to actually win the division. So I'll give him credit for doing what he can to help his team. But And, and I tell you what, uh, uh, Daniel Jones at 80% is better than Colt McCoy at 110%. So I'll take it. However, I was prepared to let my boys down easy. The Cowboys are kind of on a roll right now. They're an extremely dangerous team right now. The defense has figured something out. And Andy Dalton's pretty hot. Zeke Elliott is back to 100%. And they got Pollard. This is crazy. And I don't even want to begin to talk about the, the underachieving Cowboy uh, receiving core that all of a sudden Michael Gallup looks like a game breaker. Okay? This is <laughs> yes, crazy, man. Does. I was going to let my Giants down easy, but then I saw the bias is only four. Oh. And now I'm starting to feel like my boys might have a chance because the numbers say they have a chance. And I do believe in the numbers, even though I go against the bias quite often. This is a tough one. Well, let me say this. Let me say this. Again, both teams are in the negative in terms of bias, right? Right. Dallas came in 24th at minus 74. The Giants came in 28th at minus 81. Uh, Okay. The difference went to the Giants because Dallas was minus four in turnover differential and the Giants were plus one. So that's a five differential favoring the Giants. And that's why it's so close because the Turnover differential actually favored the Giants. However, Andy Dalton's not turning the ball over. I know. I, I, that's as soon as you said that. I'm thinking so. It's going to come down to my defense making plays and and trying to force a fumble or trying to pick off Andy. And Andy really ain't throwing no picks. Ugh, gosh. And like I said, Daniel Jones is a little gimpy. If the rush gets to him and he goes down, he does have a tendency to drop the ball. I'm going to go with the Cowboys on this one. It hurts my heart. I got to go with the Cowboys. I can understand it. As they said on the record, Falcons at Buccaneers. Bias plus score 124 favors the Buccaneers. Now, those Falcons, man, they got a change in coaching and changing some of their hierarchy, man. All of a sudden, they started winning. Then all of a sudden, they started losing again. <laughs> so I'm not sure what's going on with the Falcons. Uh, but that's a nice, healthy bias uh, going in favor of the uh, Buccaneers, man. So who do you have here? Uh, again, it's a healthy bias. It could be healthier probably if we just looked at the last couple of weeks. Um, the Falcons were, were riding pretty high there early in the season. And Matt Ryan was putting up all kinds of gigantic yardage numbers. And then all of a sudden, after showing some life real quick for a week or two, the defense just imploded. So, and we're used to seeing the Falcons defense implode. So it, it, it was just a matter of time, really. Uh, we can keep this one real short. Tom Brady 
22 or 27, extremely efficient. 348 yards. Yeah, he can still get the ball down the field. Four touchdowns in the first half. <laughs> That's a game for anybody else, including him. That's a game worth a snap. He he sat down the second half. Take the bucks, man. Forget about it. Yeah, I don't think uh let's see, let's see. The now the Buccaneers, they're already in, right? Um yeah, I think so, but they got something to play for though. So Brady's gonna play. Uh wait, hold on one second. Let me double check something for you. I see an X beside their name. Okay, so that means they clinched. Uh I think they're playing for yeah, they clinched the playoff berth, so they're trying. They still haven't won the division yet. Okay. All right. So you got a division. Right, because the Saints are in there. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. They won the division. So, yes, they will all play, and they will be uh, They'll be ready to roll. Yeah. Falcons, Falcons didn't have a chance anyway, man. Come on. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. And I don't believe that Julio is playing. I think he's hurt. Yeah, he's hurt. Yeah, so there you go. All right, next up. Speaking of the division, Packers at Bears. Bias plus score 109 favors the Packers. But are they ready for the new and improved Mitchell Trubisky? The Mitchell Trubisky was starting to look more like Josh from the uh, – from the Bills, I mean, his accuracy is up. He's he's not turning the ball over. And I understand that he has a pretty good record, actually, as a starter under Matt Nagy. So it's, they it's are, definitely a winning record. Yeah, it's a winning record. Um, matter of fact, I think, did I write a note down? Now, you know, I don't normally write the notes like you do. But Trubisky, 6-2 and two as a starter – in the last year of his contract, and under this coach, he has 17 touchdowns and six interceptions. This is not the Trubisky that we like to make fun of, but this is the Trubisky that uh, the Chicago Bears hosting the Packers. Wow. Of course, that doesn't mean as much nowadays with nobody in the stands. Chicago and Green Bay, both cold locations, so weather shouldn't be a differentiator here. Yeah, I don't know if they got any any snow in Chicago, but I'm sure they had some pretty good winds whipping off of uh, Lake Erie or whichever one of those great lakes is up there by Chicago. I tell you what, I'd like to nominate this one for you to consider as one of your intriguing games of the week. Um, both teams looked really good last week. Packers beat Tennessee 40 to 14 and the bears beat Jacksonville 41 to 17. So very complimentary uh, offensive output by both teams last week. They're both riding high. They're both looking good. The difference is the Packers have clinched the playoff spot. And I believe they've clinched the division also, but I think they want to attempt to get, home field throughout, which would be a big deal for them. Uh, so I'm expecting everybody to play at least the first half to three quarters of the game, depending on how the game flows. The Bears need to win. Bears need to win, and they're feeling good about themselves. So they're going to be extremely dangerous. And I'll just, I won't talk about uh, Aaron Rodgers' numbers last week. They were wonderful, of course. But Mitchell Trubisky uh, needs to be mentioned here. 24-35. Really nice. 265 yards, two touchdowns. He did throw one bonehead interception. I can't recall the exact um, – it was a bad – it was a horrible throw. Some, a, a wobbly duck that he probably should have thrown out of bounds. So he still has a tendency to Trubisky it up. But other than that, he was solid, and he ran in a touchdown also. But the biggest difference – and I've mentioned this for the last couple of weeks. I'll say it again. The biggest difference on this offense is their run game. David Montgomery has, I don't know if he, I don't know what's going on. 
David Montgomery looks spectacular. 23 carries, 95 yards, and a touchdown. He has scored six times in the last five weeks. David Montgomery is a factor. And when David Montgomery is running the ball like that, Mitchell Trubisky doesn't have all that pressure on his shoulders to save that team. And also, he works well off of play action. And everybody knows you can't work well off of play action if you got no real run game. So the Bears have that going for them. This is tough. They really need this game. Oh, man. This, is, this makes it even tougher. If you were to look at average scoring margins, net points, over the last three games, yeah, yeah, yeah. Green Bay is 31.7. Right. Chicago is 36.7. Oh, geez. Chicago would be favored by oh. plus five on average net points just over the last three weeks. Now, I'll be quite honest with you. Those missiles that Aaron is throwing, it's I, I would have, you know, I'd be hard pressed to go <laughs> against that. Cause I mean, you know. His arm, the more I look at his arm talent, it's ridiculous. I even tried to play with him on Madden just to see what it felt like. <laughs> the weird part about it, you know how they say that uh, uh, Russell Wilson has the that that ability to throw that deep rainbow type shot ball? Yes, yes. Aaron Rodgers, no matter what, tends to stay on a much flatter plane. It's getting from point A to point B fast as hell. It's getting, it's, it's moving. It's getting there, and it's, and it's a beautiful thing. But he doesn't tend – now, we've seen him when he was in Seattle throw the Hail Mary, so we know he can do it. But in the game, it's just – it's very difficult to get that type of Russell Wilson uh, teardrop that you'd like to see, you know, every once in a while. But um, let's face it. I mean, it is the Packers. And the Packers got the run game going, too. Yeah, I, I know. That, that makes it all the more difficult. So then I look at the other side. Is the Chicago defense going to be able to slow down Aaron Jones? And are they going to be able to double Devontae and not get hurt by uh, Tunyon or, or one of the uh, secondary wide receivers? As opposed to a somewhat, ah, geez, you know what I was getting ready to say? A somewhat weak Packers run defense that just held Derrick Henry down. Oh, this is a tough one. <laughs> Derrick Henry, though, we, we still think Derrick Henry was a little handicapped in that snow. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Montgomery is a different type of runner. We sure just, is. I remember our conversation about the type of runner that Derrick Henry is as opposed to a different type of runner. And David Montgomery is that different type of runner, which, again, makes it even tougher because I expect that Montgomery will have a good day. Oh, I know the Bears can win. <laughs> I know the Bears can win. I tell you what, I was undecided on an earlier game, and because I was undecided, I went with the bias. So undecided on this game, I'm going away from the bias. I am picking the Bears. Oh, my goodness. All right, all right. This, living, this year of living dangerously. I see you. I see you. Next up, Raiders at Broncos. Both teams are pretty much out of it. Bias plus scoring 90 favors the Raiders. Nothing to see here, folks. Um, I want the Broncos to win, actually, but I don't think they will. I think the Raiders are, are too good offensively uh, for the Broncos to be able to do anything. And Gruden's mad, so he probably went and told everybody, your job depends on this game. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'll take the Raiders. Interesting thing is Raiders definitely have the advantage offensively. They have the uh, number 11 offense and the Denver has the number uh, the, the, the 25th ranked defense. So you got the 11th offense against the 25th ranked defense. However, Raiders defense is ranked 29th and Denver offense is ranked 29th. So <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. So there you go there. We're talking about David Carr versus Drew Locke. I mean. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> they might have had a little bit of a lord, at, you know, in the middle of the season, but not now. Not so much now. Next up, 
Jaguars at Colts, bias plus 265, and ding, 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 I do believe. This is the largest bias plus of the weekend. Colts hosting the Jaguars with a 265 bias plus score favoring the Colts. Okay, so real quick, Indianapolis can clinch the AFC South Division title with a win and a Tennessee loss. Hmm. So they got to win and still may not get it if Tennessee wins. That's a lot up against you. I, I mean, I'm going to pick the Colts, obviously, okay? They have to win. If they don't win, of course they're done. But they could win and still be done. Now, they may have a chance to grab a wild card. I'm not sure. Uh, let me double check my notes here. Mm. Yeah, they got to win, and Baltimore has to lose. They have to win in Cleveland. Oh, okay. Baltimore, Cleveland, Miami. If any of them lose and the Colts win, they still get in the playoffs. So the bottom line is the Colts have to win. The Colts will win. I'm taking the Colts. Where they end up, I don't know. All right. When's the last time Phillip Rivers was in the playoffs? <laughs> uh, were they in last year? I don't think they were. It's probably been a couple of years. Yeah, it's been a hot minute. All right. Next up, Chargers. Yeah, that's who Phillip Rivers would have been with if he had been in the playoffs. Got to go in there and mess with those Chiefs who people are starting to throw little doubt pebbles their way. Bias plus score 192, however, favors the Chiefs. Okay. And uh, I still can't name most of their receivers. So what? <laughs> Bias plus score 192 favors the Chiefs. And we all we all really like the Chargers quarterback. The young, young boy still got acne. He's so young. I, yeah, you know, isn't that something? <laughs> um, man, yeah, I really love Justin Herbert. I think he's been great. Um He's got, uh, I wrote down a couple of, he got the rookie TD record. This week, he can possibly get the rookie completion record and the rookie yardage through the air record, okay? So a tremendous season for him. Offensive rookie of the year in my book, no problem, hands down. Patrick Mahomes is not playing in this game. Besides that, we talked about chinks in the armor and we talked about our teams slowly but surely starting to figure the Chiefs out a little bit. Hence, the last couple of games, they've had some problems. Or are they bored? Are they a little overconfident maybe? Uh, I'm not quite sure. I'll tell you this. Last week they beat Atlanta, but it was only 17-14. to 14. Now, this is Atlanta, who I just got finished talking about with a defense that implodes – all the dog on time, okay? Yet somehow, some way, they were in that game. And in fact, I wouldn't even say the Chiefs won the game. Atlanta lost that game. So I tell you what, I'm taking the Chargers in this one. <laughs> really? Who That's is the Chiefs backup quarterback? I can't remember. But it's somebody we know. It's it's a it's a it's a name. Uh, I just can't uh, remember exactly who it is. It, it'll come to me. It, it'll come. Ever, I'll tell you what. Give me. Ever playing the other day. Who was that? Who was he with? Give me one second, and I will give you that information. Um, but okay, so you 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 really want to live dangerously, and you want to you want to go with uh, the Chargers. Well, over the well, Chiefs here. Why, why are you saying I'm really living dangerously? What makes you think they won't sit other people like their best two pass rushers or Honey Badger or Hilaire, who's already banged up? I mean, it, <laughs> if all those guys... Well, I mean, you know, you, you have a point. I mean, it's all about people who are sitting, and that, that really is the question. Right. Uh, I guess in my mind, I'm trying to remember uh, the last time Mahomes set the uh, quarterback that came in for him, I believe, won the game. Because yeah, it's a named guy. It's a guy we know. Chad Henney. Right, Chad Henney. He's been in the league. So Chad Henney can come in and beat the Chargers. You don't think so? Not without Tyreek and Kelsey. They're all sitting, bro. I'm telling you, if they start 
They won't be in there long. Trust me. <laughs> All they right. They won't be in there long. All they right. Good enough. You're going with the Chargers. Yes, sir. Over the Chiefs. Cardinals at Rams. Now, as crazy as the NFC East is, their polar opposite NFC West is also just as crazy. Only my beloved 49ers have been eliminated in terms of the NFC West. Cardinals and Rams have to battle it out with a bias plus score of only 10 favoring the Rams. And nobody's sitting here, buddy. They already talked to uh, Kyler. Kyler's like, uh, I'm not sitting. <laughs> so you, he said, you can tweet that if you want to tweet it. I'm not sitting. So who you have in this particular NFC divisional battle? And let me mention again, as far as, I'm as, far as we can see, every game in week 17 is a division game. So yes. let the twilight music, twilight zone music. <laughs> Let's yes. get that going because it's all strange when you have division matchups. Every every game is a division matchup this week, but this is one that really, really means something because both teams have the same playoff scenario. Win and you're in. Period. Doesn't have anything to do with anybody else. They both had their own destiny in their hands playing against a division foe a team that they've already played once, a team that they've been battling for years. And all I can say is Kyler Murray's a little banged up, but Goff is out. He had to get surgery on his thumb or something. So he's done. Now, the quarterback that the Rams are coming in with is a guy named John Wolford. You know how it is sometimes when you got to play a quarterback and you have zero film on this guy. Okay. So that could be an issue. Excuse um, me. Zero NFL film. Cause they got right. plenty of CFL film. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, come on, come on now. They got <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to. I'm, okay. All right. Yeah. They got CFL film on the guy. And from what I heard, he was pretty good in the CFL. He so, won. Yeah, okay, he won. I tell you what. He's a great cup winner. The Rams defense has been faltering, brother. And every week they say, well, they got Aaron Donald and they got Jalen Ramsey and da-da-da. Guess what? They ain't looking so good. Individually, you have players that are playing well, but not enough to turn around the entire defense. They're getting scored on. People are moving the ball up and down the field on them. And – Kyler Murray can still get it done. I like the Cardinals. I'm going with the Cardinals. I'm going with the Cardinals to get into the playoffs. The Rams have the number three defense, okay? The Cardinals have the 15th ranked defense. The Rams have the 20th ranked offense, and the Cardinals have the 15th ranked Yep. I like that 15th ranked so, offense. All right, I'm going to scare you with this, and then we're going to move on. But why are you going to scare me? <laughs> I'm not going to change. I'm sticking with the Cardinals. Go ahead, scare me. What, what's the guy's name with the Rams who's starting? John Wolford. They, they kind of compared him a little bit to Taysom Hill. Oh, jeez. Okay. Anyway, what's the next game? Expect to see some running – out of the quarterback position for the Rams because that's the lowest denominator that NFL coaches go to when they're not when they're afraid to go to the higher level game of passing. All right, you quarterback left, quarterback right, and let's see what we can get going here. So this will be an interesting game. Uh, Kyler's probably not going to run as much. He's been trying not to run as much. He'll run as much as he has to. It'll be interesting to see how much the Rams quarterback actually runs. So did that scare you? Not at all. Not, not one bit, eh? <laughs> Speaking of running quarterbacks, uh, Russell at 
Russell Wilson and the Seahawks at the 49ers. Bias plus score 109 favors the Seahawks. <sighs> My yeah. beloved 49ers. Yeah. Talk about you. Go ahead. Talk about your Niners. Uh, and what's to say, man? I mean, that's that that makes perfect sense. We, you know, once we lost Garoppolo, the season pretty much didn't go as, as expected from there. I don't know if CJ Beathard can come in and, and get it done. Um, I actually like him on the game a little bit. He's not that bad. He's a little more mobile, got a strong arm. Uh, we shall see if he can run that offense. But the Niners know what they have to do. They got to get that run game going. Ayuk and all the boys running back and forth, left to right and all of that kind of stuff. If they can do that on the Seahawks, uh, then they, they might have a, a shot. Um but that's about all it is, is a shot. Who do you have in this situation? So the Seahawks have already clinched the division. So that's that's all done. But I believe another win may get them an extra home game. So they do have something to play for. I doubt if they will sit Russell. I doubt if they'll sit Metcalf, Chris Carson, and those guys. At least they'll start and then they'll probably see how the game flows. Now, here's the crazy thing. I think the Niners have a chance to be in this game and force the Seahawks coaching staff to decide, are we going to say no mas, or are we going to go all out to try to win this thing? Because Josh Wilson had a tremendous game last week, 22 carries for 183 yards. A fantastic game. I'm telling you, Mostert, Tevin Coleman, McKinnon, I doubt they keep all four. Now with Josh Wilson running like this, one of them guys might be out of here, all right? They'll still be strong in the run game. So it, it might be the guy that they can get the most for that they trade. But, um, yeah, they got something going with Josh Wilson. Great runner, good power. Good speed, good shiftiness. He's he's got a little bit of everything. Okay, um, Kittle's back. First game back, only four catches for ninety-two yards. Still the big play guy that he's supposed to be. Okay, it's kind of a shame that the Niners didn't make. If they didn't start off so bad, man, y'all would have had a shot to get in this thing. I like the Niners offensively, defensively, eh. You know, and I think that's what's going to kill you in this one. I'm going to take the Seahawks, um, but I really, really, really like your offense. And C.J. Beffitt had a decent game last week. So, I mean, he threw three touchdown passes. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, like I said, I don't, I don't. You know, he he he's more athletic than Nick Mullins. Taller, uh, probably has a stronger arm. Been around a little longer. You know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so. There you go. Okay, going with the Seahawks, sticking with the bias. Next up, and again, at this particular point, uh, Saints at Panthers, we are just about, we're into the 4 o'clock or 4.30 games uh, on Sunday. Bias plus score, 143, favors the Saints. And the Saints, do they have anything to, uh, to play for? Well, they're in already. Right. Yeah, they Carolina's uh, out already. They clinched their division, so the only thing that they would have to play for is maybe an extra home game, uh, if if they're able to finish with a better record than, I think Seattle. Yeah, they're both sitting at eleven and four right now, so that's both teams are kind of in the same situation. It's like, well, we're in, and we did win our division, so they should get a home game to start, okay? But you wanna to try to stay at home, stay at home as much as possible. So again, it's one of those games where we're gonna start our guys, we're gonna to try to get a lead and then finish this team off. And if they give us a lot of trouble, we may just say, you know what? Pull Breeze, pull Kamara, let's get out of here and just get ready for the playoffs. I don't think the Panthers are gonna be able to put up that much of a fight. So I'm gonna take the Saints uh, confidently, and uh, I believe that they will win their game and, and, and have no problems. How they figure out uh, home field advantage and things like that between them and the Seahawks, 
will remain to be seen. They'll probably have to go to a tiebreaker or something. I don't know. But the first thing you want to do is you want to win the game. You want to achieve as much as possible. You know what I mean? So they got to go for the win. All right. There you go. Going with the bias on that one. All right. Next up. Now, you mentioned some of the other teams were going to be dependent on what the Titans do. The Titans are favored by a bias plus score of 146, visiting the Houston Texans. Titans favored. What okay. about you? Yeah, I'm going to take the Titans. No problem. Let me just say a, a few last words for Deshaun. Unbelievable season on an individual basis. Even more unbelievable with what he's been up against. Losing De De DeAndre Hopkins before the season even starts. Losing Will Fuller, who stepped up mightily as a number one receiver. Losing him to PEDs. Okay? Little to no run game whatsoever. All right? Dennis Johnson, as far as I'm concerned, is a bust. One game, one year wonder when he was with the Cardinals. Uh, Duke Johnson, perennial backup. They just really have no weapons. Yet somehow, some way, this guy throws for 300 plus yards and, and multiple touchdowns every single week. A few more wins, and he would be in the MVP conversation. It's it's really a shame. I feel really really bad for him. I kind of hope. If they figure something out, they need a GM, they need a coach, they need a defense. They need a lot, bro. Either they let him loose or they really make a serious effort to rebuild that team. That's all I got to say about Deshaun. Now, Titans got to win this game. If they win, they clinch the AFC South. Tennessee can clinch the AFC South. Division. Yes. If they win... They clinched the AFC South. Now, that makes me think, yep, that's right. They are good to go. They got to win, okay? Now, they could still get it if Miami loses or Baltimore loses. It's one of those kind of things. So you don't want to leave it up to another team because they could all win. So you have to win your game. If you win, you negate all those other situations and you're in and you get the division title. So take the Titans, they go all out. They'll probably crush the Texans, in fact. Um, and that'll be the end of that. <laughs> and that'll be the end of that. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Deshaun Watson finished 10th in QBR in the league this year. So for all his trials and tribulations, he's still a really good quarterback, no doubt about it. I think he was first or second in completion percentage, too. Something like that. No, no. What's the other stat besides QBR? Pass rating. Pass rating. He was one or two in pass rating, I think. At least top three. It's amazing what he's done with so little talent. Amazing. He's two in pass rating. That, that's incredible. Two in pass rating. Yeah. That's incredible, man. <laughs> with what he's working with? Oh, my gosh. Whew. Unbelievable. I posted during the week as I was calculating the bias plus score that I had just calculated the bias plus score for the last regular season game of the NFL 2020 season. And here it is. Washington at Eagles. The football team is going to come into Philadelphia sporting a bias plus score of 82, favoring the Washington football team, who I understand is considering the name of the Washington football club for next year. <laughs> Are you serious? You just made that up. No, I didn't. <laughs> They kind of like the Washington football, but what if for whatever reason, instead of using team, they want to they're thinking about going with club. It's not hard and fast yet, but it has been discussed and reported. So that sounds I'm like just a, letting you know. Sounds like a soccer team. <laughs> it does. 
which you never know, considering all of the soccer fans out there, they might flood into the stadium not knowing where they could. Hey, what are they doing picking up the ball and running with it? Uh, <laughs> I thought this was a soccer game. <laughs> Too late, we got your ticket. <laughs> we got your money. They got to do better than that, bro. Well, we shall they see. The question is, can they do better than the Eagles this weekend? We were talking about spoilers. Eagles are out of it, but they would absolutely love to spoil the Washington football team's chances, I believe, because that's just Philly. Would they, though? Because if the Eagles win this game and Dallas wins their game, the dreaded Dallas Cowboys win the division. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that out there. I think the Eagles are going to go all out to try to win this game, obviously. Uh, it's been a really bad season for them. Um, I think every week that they've been out there playing and Carson Wentz hasn't been on the field, uh, you know, you've heard people say that the team looks like they're playing harder. They look like they really are trying to win. It look like they're really trying to help Jalen Hurts. I believe all those things to be true. I also believe that they feel uh, that this is their best chance individually to put some good game tape together in case there's a big shakeup in Philadelphia next year, which there really could be. You got a lot of uh, people on offense that are on the cusp uh, of being on a team or being cut and or traded. Um, th th there's a lot of different situations with wide receivers on this team. Obviously, uh, you got some backup linemen that are trying to make sure they're still here next year. Um, so, yeah, I believe that the Eagles will play hard. However, the Washington football team, soon to be club or whatever they're going to end up being, are no slouch. And their defense is still really good. And Jalen Hurts is still kind of feeling his way. He's a dynamic player. He can do a lot of things, okay? But the one thing that gives him trouble, like most young quarterbacks, is pressure. And that's the one thing that the Washington football team can bring is a lot of pressure. Also, uh, Taylor Heineke, people have been calling him Heineken and all kind of stuff. His name is Taylor Heineke. We've only seen him for one quarter. In the fourth quarter of the Carolina game last week, which they lost probably because Dwayne Haskins is so terrible that he didn't leave Heineke much to work with. But Heineke um, in the fourth quarter was 12 and 19, which isn't terrible. He's only 137 yards. He did throw a touchdown and it was a nice one. It was like a 40 something yard bomb to JD McKissick. He also ran the ball three times, a la Mr. Wolford. Yes, Heineke can run, okay? He ran the ball for 22 yards on three rushes. Um, Antonio Gibson just came back from an injury, he only carried the ball 10 times because they were trying to take it easy on him. He gained 61 yards on 10 carries. That's doggone good, okay? And J.D. McKissick had eight catches for 77 in that, in that, uh, that one Heineke touchdown. So I like Washington in this game. I think Washington is going to win this game. Uh, I would have to double check, but if Washington wins and Dallas wins, I believe – Washington has the tiebreaker and would win the division. I'll tell you in two seconds. Dallas can clinch the NFC East division if they win and Washington loses. So guess what? It must probably work the other way around too. Washington can clinch the NFC, NFC East with a win. Oh, so Dallas needs to win and they need Washington to lose. Otherwise, Washington wins. Washington needs to win to get in, period. If I'm reading this correctly, and I believe that I am. Yep, Washington can clinch if they win. Dallas can clinch if they win and Washington loses. 
and the Giants are in the same boat as Dallas. They have to win, and they need Washington to lose. So Washington holds the tiebreakers over everybody. They win, it's over. Take Washington. And Alex Smith? Questionable. Not out of the question. He is a possibility. I don't think they're going to play him. I just... I just I think they're I think they're a little scary about him. Okay. All right. Yeah. And I and, and I also think they have some faith in Heineke. <laughs> so I'm I'm going with him. Going with Heineke. All right. All right. So you're going uh with the bias on this one and taking the Washington football team. All right. Well that wraps up the bias plus reports for week 17 and what we like to do at the end of the bias plus reports is talk about the previous week's bias plus buster of the week and ben i don't know if i've ever seen this before since we've been tracking the bias plus buster of the week where we've had a team do it Two straight weeks in a row. Two weeks in a row. New York Jets. The New York Jets, fate, they were facing an unfavorable bias plus score of 207, one by plus seven, giving them a bias plus buster score of 214. Congratulations to the New York Jets. J E T S, Jets, 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 who believe in the saying. You play, you win the game. Win the game. <laughs> you know I knew one thing. Doggone Sam Darnold was like, if we could just win a game or two, I don't have to worry about them drafting Trevor Lawrence and I could probably keep my job. <laughs> so Sam Darnold is as happy as a mug right now, and he should be. Yeah, he earned it. They beat Sam, Darnold, Sam Darnold was up for uh, angry runs. On <laughs> After he finished, and he still be angry. Anytime they listen, anytime they say we want you to lose so we can bring this guy in to take your job, how would you feel? Like you know what I mean? Look, Wentz had a conniption when he drafted Hurts. He didn't even know what was happening till it happens, and he almost lost his mind and lost his job worrying about it. Uh. You know what I mean? And they're telling this guy before the season's over, "Oh yeah, you're you're out of here next year, buddy." That's crazy. That that is that that is rather bizarre. I mean, especially when you put it that way. I really hadn't thought about it. Like we, you know, we want somebody to come in to take your job. <laughs> right. Like if we don't win any games, we get the number one pick. And we're telling you now, we're taking Trevor Lawrence. Oh, you know, man, number one pick overall. Number one pick overall usually plays the first year. Yeah. 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 That's what you brought him in there for. You know, you didn't, you didn't bring him in there for anything else. So no doubt about it. All right. Well, that wraps up the bias plus reports for week 17 of the 2020 NFL season. Next up commentary. You ready for that? Mr. Dickinson. What thing? What do we got? All right, let's just go through some things. I try to keep it on the positive side. So when we talk about commentary, we go to Ben and Barry on football on Facebook. So let's just give some love to Alvin Kamara for a six touchdown day. Not many guys <laughs> get to do that, Benny. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind when they announced this and I'll tell you what, I didn't know Ernie Nevers had done it because I have this old paperback book, I gotta find it, about pro football. And it goes over all the old guys like Jim Thorpe and Red Grange and all that stuff. And it goes into detail about those guys. So I kind of remembered about Ernie Nevers who was a great player in his day. But the first thing that really came to my mind was Gail Sayers, our favorite guy, okay? He had six touchdowns in one game too. But I think he got two on the ground, one through the air, a punt return, 
or two punt returns and a kick return, something like that. Against my beloved Niners in the mud. Yes, yes, which is a great game in its own right, okay? But six on the ground, yeah, that's big. That's big. That's an amazing thing, you know. And, and a lot of them were real close. I mean, he had to – he was squeaking past that touchdown line. <laughs> but he got it done, man. So congratulations to Alvin Kamara on that. Wanted to mention we all – I like to try to bring up the positive things that are happening in the NFL. The Packers have teamed up with the Brewers, the Bucks, and Microsoft to form what they call the Equity League. And as you can see, it's a new impact investment division of venture capital fund Title Town Tech, which they had already founded. That was already in operation. It's right across the street from the uh, Packers uh, football stadium. Uh, and they're looking to develop and invest in minority entrepreneurs and growth companies and create scalable social change. So that's a pretty power-packed collaboration right there, man. Packers, the Bucks, the, the Brewers, and Microsoft. So, so Title Town Tech, that's a technology company? That's like a incubator system that they have right across the street from... Uh, and again, as a venture capital fund, they're looking to put money into startups. Okay. Know, early, okay. early, uh, early business businesses that are early in their stage, early stage okay. business. That's what I'm looking for. All That's right. Cool. Uh, as I said last week, the intriguing game of the week was the Titans and Green Bay. It was. Uh, more than intriguing. <laughs> it was a very interesting game watching that go through. I didn't see what I thought I was going to see, which was a big day from Derrick Henry. But let me mention, since you brought up our boy, that the Bears will be honoring Gail Sayers this coming weekend. And so I definitely had to put that up there. Yeah, the Kansas Comet. Our man, Gail Sayers, no doubt about it. Anytime you see Gail Sayers, or anytime I see Gail Sayers, you know, I'll be uh, sharing that on Ben and Barry because it is, again, both of our uh, favorite football team. And I, again, I want you know, uh, to go back, NFL Good Works, uh, you're talking about uh, inspired change, Operation Hope, providing a pathway for economic uh, advancement. And again, this is somebody that went to the Players Coalition, that $88 million uh, is all part of this Inspired Change uh, program that the NFL has. And that encompasses a lot of different organizations where they're out funding and supporting a lot of the information. A lot of these football players have their own foundations. You know you're making so a lot of money when you form your own foundation. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's some serious money there. Um, but again, a place to go to find out what the NFL is doing that's positive in the community. So I did want to just bring that up right there. So uh, last but not least, that's pretty much it for that. Okay. I don't have a whole lot uh, beyond that, Benny. Um, we can pretty much get ready to wrap up my, I will say my number one knucklehead last week, Mr. Dwayne Haskins has been released from the Washington football team. I didn't hear any stampedes running in his direction from other teams looking to snatch him up. So it'll be interesting to see how his career goes from this point on. Um, but that's pretty much it for me. What do you have? Uh, just on the, on the Dwayne Haskins note, uh, young guys make mistakes, you know, and we're always talking about, you know, people deserve a second chance and this, that, and the other. Um, but rather than, uh, if, I, if I'm a GM or an owner, uh, I, I can look beyond the uh, not wearing the mask in the, in the, in the, in the strip club. 
this dude is not a good player. He's not an NFL quarterback. He's not ready. Now, it's not to say that he can't become one, but I think he needs a stint in a CFL or an XFL or something because there seems to be a problem either with his work ethic or his, his understanding of concepts. The guy just didn't show me that he can handle the pressure of being an NFL quarterback besides the dumb things that he's done. So it's going to be a real uphill battle for him to get back into the league. Uh, like you said, I, I don't, I don't see anybody knocking his door down and try to get him anytime soon. That doesn't mean that somebody mo mo maybe won't take a chance on him um, next season in the preseason. If there actually is one, you know, somebody might invite him in for OTAs or something and give him a look. He obviously has the physical skills, okay, but his his mentals, I'm not sure are there, bro, and I don't know if they'll ever be there. And Again, I said early on the year he was drafted, a, a college quarterback who has a really good to even a great season but only has one, I'm questioning him a little bit. And he was taken really high in the draft off of that, and I didn't agree with it, and he didn't pan out, so – you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, before we go, also let me mention today is December 31st, 2020. It is officially New Year's Eve. So let me say Happy New Year and wishing a uh, happy, healthy, and prosperous 2021 to all of our followers, anyone who's watching the videos, again, Ben and Barry on football. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Instagram and on Facebook. Let me throw out that we do have a gift that came through. We have a mm, three, two, three-week-old grandson who just joined the family. So we have plenty of uh, reason to celebrate. And let me say happy anniversary to my love, Crystal Mitchell, Today is our anniversary. We did get married on New Year's Eve. You were there. It was a nasty, crazy night. What a party. <laughs> yes, yes. When you can go straight from the reception to the New Year's Eve party <laughs> in one smooth flow, that's how to do it. So we, we did it right, at least on that particular night. So thank you again for everything. Happy New Year to you. Any last words? Yeah, Happy New Year to you, too. Happy New Year to all the viewers out there. Hope 2021 is a good, great, prosperous year. And other than that, go Knowles.